You're listening to the Higher Calling Podcast. I'm Pete Newsom, and this is your source for all things hiring, staffing, and recruiting. Back with Ricky Baez on a beautiful Friday morning. Ricky, how are you today? I'm doing great, Pete, and yourself? I'm doing well, man. It's been a great week, and yeah. um, hot as can be, of course, and, and <laughs> here in Florida, but uh, there's worse things that, that could be going on. You know, that is, it's funny you say that, right? Because when, when life kind of throws lemons at you, um, you tend to forget how worse things can possibly be, right? Yeah, and do, yeah, <laughs> and we have a long way we could go. But I, I had what I thought was going to be a surprise for you today, but I'm, I'm very disappointed with my camera to see that my shirt is uh, not, <laughs> not visible. Of you know, I'm calling HR on my I, shirt, and um, and you can't even see it on the camera. Well, I mean, I mean, I can see it now. I love how your shirt implies you're going to call HR before you even engaging in any kind of meaningful conversation about the issue. <laughs> just, that's, just that's straight, to, straight, straight to the point. I'm calling HR. That's Dude, what I just said now. good morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you said it in a way that offended me, Ricky. <laughs> So, okay. Have a crappy morning. How does that sound? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I it, yeah, that we, we, um, we all have to be careful these days. How about that's right. That a hundred percent spot on. Yes, sir. You know how they, you know, everyone says, well, you know, and, and if there's a recession, you know, healthcare is not going to be affected, right? We're always going to have healthcare. We're always going to you know, have education. Well, now we're always going to need HR. I think you're in the safest you know, possible corporate department now because, with, well, with the way things are trending, HR is only going to become more important. Well, he and and <laughs> you're right, by the way. But here's here's the problem with that, because then when HR gets tired, who do we go to besides the uh, the general manager at the local ABC liquor store? You just right? well, <laughs> <laughs> you just call each other. <laughs> All right, great. We call each other, share stories, and uh, yeah, that's exactly what we do. I, I think. Uh, that's a show that we should do. No, it's a show that would be great to do. We probably shouldn't do because that'll, my opinions on, on um, the use of HR and, and the reason why HR is so important these days is probably, uh, I should probably keep some of those thoughts to myself. No, what more reason to do the show, Pete? Come on. I am looking forward to that show. All right. Just, yeah, All right. I, I'm down if you are. I'm well, you know, I'm not I'm not known for keeping quiet. <laughs> even when I well, should, we'll so. do this. Let's do that show on camera. You'll wear the I'm calling HR. Uh, you you wear the I'm calling HR shirt and I'll get one that says I'm on vacation. There you go. <laughs> there you go. HR is on vacation. Boom. Done. We'd have to you know, solve our own problems and work things out as individuals together. We don't we don't do that. Imagine anymore. that. Imagine that. Do notion. that. <laughs> Oh, awesome. awesome. But here we are on a hot yet beautiful Florida day. And yeah. we have some Q&A today that we're going to do that. We do. Awesome. Yes. We, we have some questions that have been sent in to us. So if you're listening, by all means, join in. We, we love getting questions. The more, the better. Um, you can always email us hirecalling at fourcornerresources.com. So by all means, fire away, but we have three today. So um, mm. let's let's take them one at a time. You ready? Roger that. Yes, sir. So the first one, I know we've probably spoken about this before, but it's it's an ongoing problem as the labor market continues to be tight, although it's loosening up a little bit. We think that trend is going to continue, but candidates continue to be in high demand. And as such, candidate behavior can um you know, be a little more, I'll say, loose in, in these times than it can when um, unemployment um, is, is in a different situation. But, um, you know, candidate ghosting, candidates not showing up for an interview continues to be a thing. So the question today is, how can I ensure my candidate won't ghost me? So why don't you ta tackle that from a corporate standpoint? So this is a recruiter asking this, right? So a recruiter is asking this. So here's, ah, Pete, how much time do we have? <laughs> here's why, because I, I'm a firm believer that we, and by we, I mean businesses, we, we kind of built this monster, right? So you know how the Joker kind of built Batman and the Batman kind of built the Joker? This is kind of like the same thing, right? This is, I think we built this monster years ago, where as organizations, when we had a lot of interviews here and there, we kind of ghosted candidates, 
mm. right? It, we 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 kind of did. Now, I'm not saying you did that or, or I did that because ever since I've been involved in recruiting, one of my biggest pet peeves is don't treat the candidate like a candidate. Treat the candidate like a human being. Treat a candidate like somebody like who who's there for a reason, which they are, right? So I'm going to start answering this question, Pete, by saying set expectations. If you if you start your onboarding process, and I use onboarding process in air quotations, as soon as the person applies for the organization, then you're going to have a better output in them showing up to whatever interview you guys set up. And here's what I mean by that, that as soon as the person applies for the job, then you as the recruiter, you as the organization, you let them know exactly what they're going to expect in the entire interview process. What happens after pre-screen, what happens after the initial interview, what happens after this, you give them a roadmap. If you give a candidate a roadmap of what to expect, they're going to have a more vested interest in that short-term relationship and the more the more possibilities of them showing up, right? But if you treat them like candidate number four, five, six, seven, eight, then they're gonna look at you like the the same way. So really quick snapshot, as soon as they apply, let them know what to expect as they progress through the interview process. After, before each interview, a reminder a day before, a reminder 30 minutes before, hey, you got everything you need, are you ready? Let them know, give them every opportunity to tell you, hey, you know what, this isn't for me. That's a right? great point that, I, that, that you just made, that, that you know, give them an out. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I've often said one of my lines, I think you just heard me say it earlier this week is you know, from a staffing perspective, we're here to qualify candidates, both from the ability to do the job uh, from a skill standpoint, from, you know, fit in well with the culture, whatever those requirements may be. But we're also here to deliver a candidate who wants the job, who's motivated and interested to take it. And we are not in the square peg round hole business. That is a mm -hmm. saying that you know, applies here for sure. So from a staffing perspective, right from the start, it should be a feeling out process of, of understanding what the candidates motivations are, what their drivers are, what their goals and interests and objectives are in their job search and career, um, their job search processes, they look out on their career and I highly recommend any third party recruiter starting with all of that before you even talk about a specific job. Now, th this is a general mm -hmm. statement, but I think from corporate recruiting, a lot of it is reactive, meaning you post job ads and the candidates apply and then come to you. And that's how the relationship initiates mm -hmm. where third party staffing is, is often the opposite where it's proactive recruiting. And in that case, which is, which is the world we live in, our process it, uh, evolves around finding out about the candidate before we tell them about the job. Because once you put that information out there, it's there you the go. rest of the conversation, right? There I mean, you go. If they're on the market and they're unemployed and they're, 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 they may be uh, eager and willing to accept things that aren't really a good fit long term or even medium term. Um, and you don't want to do that. I mean, no one wins long you know, in that situation. So, um, always start by understanding the candidate's interests anytime you can. And, and then, you know, that'll certainly lessen the likelihood that that, you know, the ghosting will happen and continue, as you said, it's such a great point to assess along the way and look for um, what, what we call red flags, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they can be subtle and you've got to be direct about those things. Hey, Ricky, I asked you, um, you know, about your availability to interview and it seems like you're finding, you know, having a hard time coming up with, with, with a time frame or, or times that fit, I'm getting the impression you're not that interested yeah. in this job or you're not as interested as you were, uh, you know, let people off the hook situations yeah. change <laughs> and you have to be um, willing to pay attention uh, to those and, and act when you, when you sense that that interest uh, by the candidate may be waning. You know, we were, we were at a meeting yesterday with, the entire company, you said something that stuck with me that is perfect for this question, right? You said, we should not be selling the opportunity for the candidate, we should put the candidate in the in the position where they get to sell to us. Why? Why should they? 
I don't want to say be worthy, but why should they want to come to us? It should be the other way around. And if you position it that way, and you put the candidate in a position to why why should they explain to us why they should come over here, then they have a more vested interest in that opportunity, right? Because if you position it that way, if people jump ship at the first part of that conversation, then that's somebody who was going to possibly ghost you later on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like right? anything in life, don't make it too easy. You know, if, yeah. if it's easy to get in, it's easy to walk away. And we when staffing is done right, and this is this is my very, very strong professional opinion on this, um, the process of deciding whether the job is a good fit should both be mutual by the recruiter as well as the candidate yep. and thorough. So be, don't, don't be quick to send a candidate to, um, to interview because yep. it has to be earned. And as a recruiter, your obligation should also be to share as much information about the, the role prior to the interview as you possibly can. So you get all the potential bad out of the way. I mean, that's how I think of it, right? Like if we, let's put all that up front. If uh, let's say the job you know, doesn't pay quite as much as the candidate would otherwise want, mm -hmm. or the hours are um, unusual, or the commute is long or whatever it might be, anything that's potential negative don't hide those things, put those yeah. front and center and out there. yeah, out there early and often in my view has always been, or my, my way of thinking it, of it is if you eliminate all the bad, you're only left with good and that should yeah. be the goal. So by the time the interview is set or an offer is made, it's not a question of, of whether the candidate's going to ghost or, or not accept um, because you've already, you've already taken care of that. It should be a celebration. Right, an interview <laughs> schedule. This is a win. Everyone wins together. At, uh, you know, and, and same thing with a job offer. So, I think recruiters too often want to keep the process moving, want to keep the candidate going forward, and want to hear a yes. But that may a no is often not the answer you you want, but it's the answer you certainly need, and you want it as soon as possible. <laughs> now, yes. So now, now that's from the recruiter's perspective. Let's look at this from the candidate's perspective. So I'm speaking to the candidates directly. If you're not feeling a job, if you're not feeling a, a you know, after after you apply and you interview for the first two times and you get two more interviews to go, you feel good about that position, the first two interviews, the last two, you're like, I don't know. I don't know if this is the right thing for me. Make that call, candidates. Call your recruiter. Say, you know what? Thank you for your time. I'm realizing right now this is not something that I want, obviously, the recruiter is going to want to know why. Let them know why. But if you pick up that phone and you call, or you send a text, or you send an email, let that that recruiter know, thanking them for the time, but this is not for you. They're going to appreciate that. They're going to appreciate that a heck of a lot more than everybody who, by the way, you're going to have some big salaries who are going to stop what they're doing to come meet you and you don't show up. It's just, it's just bad form. Right. And I'm not saying recruiters and people in uh, in, in corporate America, they remember these things, but not on purpose, but we do. I'm not going to lie. I've seen situations where somebody has interviewed with me before and I'm like, I remember this. I remember this person from a year ago who ghosted me. Right. So what do I do at that point? Right. <laughs> so people remember. So just make sure you leave a really good impression. And it's just it's just good business practice. And it's it's an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. you know, even yes. if you don't want to make a live phone call, um, it, it, you know, there's no excuse for not yeah. delivering that message in advance in writing. If, if you need to go on zengig.com, go to our interview questions section. You, yes. you actually have templates out there that you can co copy and paste and use to decline an interview, but don't ghost anyone. Um, it's just not worth it. The reputational hit, and you never know how that's going to come back. It's around the world. Right. Uh, people will remember and should remember, right? I mean, that why, of course, you want to know how someone behaves in a situation where they have to deal with something that I, I hesitate to even call it confrontational, but no one likes to deliver bad news. But, you know, a sign of good character is willingness to do the hard things you know, even when you don't want to, right? I mean, that's, well, <laughs> that's who you want to remember. And no one, you know, it's a weird thing to think that recruiters at 
and third party recruiters at times will get upset when candidates back out of an interview. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's, well, it's not the outcome again that we want. It's people will always do what's best for them in their situation as they should, you know, no one should, should be willing to entertain a job because someone else mm -hmm. wants them to that's, that's silly. You know Let, let's, Let's speak on that real quick because you just said something that it, it, it's it's is an important indicator, right? Because you're right. Let's recruiters do get upset when people back out, right? But you, I rather have you let me know you're backing out than me finding out the hard way. But even let's talk about those those situations where the recruiters are upset about it. Okay, they're human beings. They worked a lot on this, so I completely understand why they would be upset. But here's why this is good news. If you have a candidate that tells you a day before the interview, you know what, th this isn't for me, you should be thanking them. You should be thanking them that they called you because you'd rather have that person back out then than back out three months into the job before Absolutely. your client or the organization gets any return on investment for all the time, money, and effort spent into bringing that person on board. Absolutely. So, yeah, it hurts. That's fine. Let's deal with it. But you should be thanking that candidate for letting you know early enough in the relationship that this was not for them. Another one of you know the things that I've learned and really have ingrained um, and, and try to share with our, my team over the, the years that I've been in recruiting is bad news early is good news. So absolutely. And it's not going to be a good fit for the job. Let's find out on the first phone call. If not the first phone call, the second, if not the yeah. second you know, before the interview after the interview, you know, it, as soon as possible, you don't want to find out after an offer has been made. You don't want to find out after someone started because that is, you know, everyone loses in, in that scenario. Yeah. So yeah, of course, when things don't go your way, it's natural to be disappointed. Um, and, and to that point, recruiters need to check their own behavior with that and make sure that they're not, um, expressing frustration anger to the candidate who doesn't who doesn't deserve it right now yeah. you may deserve it if you go someone that's <laughs> yeah <important. laughs> um but just for doing what's best for you at situations change now i've got to put a, a recommendation out there for corporate recruiters as well okay. you mentioned it uh, you, i don't think you um, necessarily know what you said but you said it. you've had, gone to two interviews and you have two more okay if corporate uh, you know, organizations are interviewing someone four times or <laughs> even more, I'll give you two, maybe. But do so at your own peril, right? I mean, proceed you know, as, as you will, but understand you're doing this to yourself. If you're dragging yeah. out a hiring process for a candidate, shame on you. And you know, this is not the market to be doing that in. I, I don't know that it's ever a necessary thing, um, you know, depending on the situation, timing, the number of people that need to be involved. I mean, you could make arguments uh, in some scenarios where it is necessary and perhaps in some scenarios it is, but it should be the exception. You should, you should interview, you know, hire someone with as few interviews as possible. Do you agree with that? I agree a thousand percent, Pete. About 10 years ago, I was interviewing with a large restaurant chain a large restaurant chain. You know, when you hear your family, you're catching my drift, right? And uh, and I interviewed with them six times, six times for an employee, for an employee relations manager. Now, here's the thing. On one side, I could understand why um, just if you if, if you don't figure it out in two or three, then why do you continue on? On the other side, I get it. They want to make sure they got the right person. But how they did it was awesome, Pete. I got to tell you, throughout that entire process, first interview was done, I got a $50 gift card. Second interview was done, I got a $50 gift card. And I'm like, I didn't want the interviews to stop. Keep it rolling. <laughs> Keep it rolling, man. It, it, it's, it, at the end of the day, I'm going to have enough gift cards to take care of my entire Christmas list. Yeah, I'll right? interview five <laughs> times a day. Keep no, but you know what? They, they spend a lot of time and effort. What... That's where I learned about being the GPS because I knew exactly what to expect.
And, yep. and, and that's exactly what they told me. And being, you know, being in that position on the other side of that table, I also know how it feels like when you interview and you think it went well, you think it's the last one and the next call is going to be the offer. And that phone rings, you pick up. Yeah, did I get it? Yes, you got the opportunity to interview again. Can you come back next week? I'm like, oh my God, it's been five times. What are we doing here? Yeah, so, so I get it from both sides. I do. But but the, the salient point and, and the really important one um, of, of as, as much as anything we've talked about so far is communicate up front, get it all up front early. It, it, this matters for um, you know, the, what the job is, whether, whether there's some, some negative things about it. No job's perfect. No, no. candidate's perfect either. I, I would That's say right. the same thing. You know, when you're considering a candidate, get the bad stuff out there, right? Yeah. Get, get it out. Um, and then and then decide if you still like each other. It's like that meme. If you don't, if you didn't love me at this, you don't deserve me at that. You know, <laughs> where, wherever. So find find out what the bad is and and see if you, the job interest is still there and see if the candidate interest is still there. And more often than not, it will be. No one likes surprises at the end. No one likes surprises when it comes to finding out there's one more interview. So it applies there too. Say it all up front. And if there's going to be five interviews, the, the company is. Um, committed to that process. They've decided it's important to them. As long as they acknowledge they're going to lose some candidates along the way, it's still worth it. That's fine. But share it. Give everyone yeah. a schedule. Say, you know, always what the finish line looks like and how far you have to go to get there. And that'll save you a lot of heartache along the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think we knocked that one out of the, out of the part, Pete. We just solved ghosting. It's done. <laughs> ghosting <laughs> for in the recruiting world. It's uh let the ghost busting to the Ghostbusters. Yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. you kids out there with your relationships, you know, they're on your own. I, I know. <laughs> um, you kids out there with relationships, why do you sound like you're tired to yell at kids to get off your lawn, Pete? I mean, well, <laughs> you kids and your relationships. Well, because <laughs> I've never um, been out there in that situation as an adult. So, you know, my, my wife and I met each other in school, so I have no. I have no value to add in that area whatsoever. Thank Roger you. that. Yeah. Got it. I'm, I feel very fortunate that I don't. Um, awesome. All right. Question number two. Yes. I'm having a hard time. Not me. This is a question. I may be, maybe I'm having a hard time. I don't know. I'm, but our, um, one of our listeners is having a hard time increasing their LinkedIn network and want to have some advice or tips on how they can grow it organically. So what, what say you to that? Let's first define what organic organically means in this realm, right? Um, so organically, meaning that you don't pay for, for ads, you don't pay, everything comes based on the work you put out on LinkedIn. Yep. So this is something I really, truly believe in and really, truly care about. I know you do as well, Pete, because it's, it's, it's you, like me, realize the value of LinkedIn if used properly. Right. So we first have to understand how the algorithm of LinkedIn works. Now, by no means am I an IT professional, but I do happen to know how the algorithm works. And it works like this. The whole point of LinkedIn is social media, but for business. It's Facebook, but for business. So whenever you start putting things or producing content or liking or sharing content or engaging in comments of a specific subject, they t the algorithm tends to put people with like minded um, uh, ideas onto your page and vice versa. So here's what I tell people like and share and comment engage in conversation as much as possible in an area you're interested in. Not only that produce content where there is doing little two minute videos of what it is you're passionate about about the specific subject that you want more people to come at you at um, and throw it out there what's going to happen is when you produce content and other people like and share and engage in you with that content you're going to come up on their feed when you come up on their feed their network is going to see what you're liking and what you're sharing and then they it, it's like a I hate to call it a disease but it spreads right but what i'm saying is the best thing you can do is to produce content on a consistent basis maybe once a week start once a week start producing that relevant content and start sharing start tagging people so they can be engaged in it the more you do that the more people are going to start following you now 
if you're looking, if you're a recruiter looking for candidates, the more a candidate sees you or a client, the more a client sees you active on LinkedIn from a recruiter perspective, from a staffing agency's perspective, the more they see that, it's like McDonald's, right? You don't go there every day, but the more you see it every day, the more you recognize that brand, right? right? So you want people to recognize you as that powerhouse in that recruiting realm. And the only way you're able to do that is if you're consistent and you're, and you're producing relevant content on LinkedIn. It's, it's, it's really good advice. Like anything else, um, if you want to have success from it, you have to put activity towards it and mm -hmm. it does require some effort. I think a lot of people are naturally intimidated by putting out public comments. Yeah. There's those who do so at the, even when they shouldn't. And, and yeah. Yeah, we see that on Twitter very often. We see it on LinkedIn. Um, but I think there's the bigger you know, group of people that are hesitant to share their opinions. They, they don't, you know, it, it's easier to keep quiet than to risk any backlash or mm. negative comments. And unfortunately, you know, in our divisive society that we have right now, there, there's a lot of, of that, right. For every, every comment. And I, you, we yeah. all see it on LinkedIn where, someone makes an innocuous statement and, and some, someone else has issue with it, right? Like, you know, you shouldn't be nice to everyone at work. <laughs> like, <laughs> so we'll have a reason why that's not a good idea or whatever. Um, I'm not immediately coming up with a good analogy for that. I, I will a second. I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. But it's the value of doing it. The benefit outweighs the perceived risk and the, and the, and the risk is, is relatively small. So you, you made a, a great point, which is find the things that are interesting to you. And LinkedIn continues to evolve and become more, I'll say like Facebook than it was, you know, than it has in the past, right? It, it, it's evolving constantly. Um, people are sharing very personal, you know, maybe even kind of private stuff out there. And I'll tell you, that seems to get the most attention where a business yeah. conversation is, even though I would tell you that's what LinkedIn is, is should really be about. Um, I don't use it like Facebook personally, but those who do get a lot more likes and comments and shares. It, yeah. it just does. So, you know, people love cat videos. What are you going to do? I mean, well, <laughs> it's the way of the world. Well, let's talk about that real quick, right? Because it, it's, it's, it goes back to what I said. It's got to be something interesting because if you're always liking and sharing controversial issues on LinkedIn or cat videos, that's the, that's how people are going to see you, True. right? You're exposing yourself. You said something that's really interesting, Pete. And I had to write it down. You said people, people are reserved on LinkedIn because they're afraid of backlash, yep. right? And, and that is a hundred percent true statement. So that said, he, here's what I say. If you're afraid of putting stuff out there because of backlash, number one, be sure you're passionate and you really truly know about the subject you're talking about. You're not going to know everything a hundred percent of the time, but if somebody comes back and says, well, actually I found some other information that's A, B, and C, then ask for more information, engage in that conversation, thank them for bringing that other point of view. Don't argue with them without, you know, knowing that, because if you show, if you engage in healthy conflict on LinkedIn, you're showing everybody how you handle opposing points of view. And that's important to know because leaders are watching, recruiters are watching, hiring authorities are watching. And if you do that quite a bit, you're going to become not a celebrity, but your name is going to come up often on their feeds. And if you happen to interview them and they recognize you, they put two and two together, they're either going to know you love cat videos and, and love confrontation, or they're going to know that you know how to engage in healthy conflict and trying to understand the other person's point of view, which will help you in an interview in the long run. Yeah, the, the good outweighs the, the potential bad by far. We, yes. we, we, we both know that. Um, others, I think, have to experience it for themselves to to buy into that. And yeah, that was, I was in the, that situation and, um, not too long ago prior to turning to uh, creating a lot of digital content, which has been almost four years now. I was hesitant to put my opinions out, out and, um, more so for us on on the um, on our website on the internet than than LinkedIn, but we share everything on LinkedIn, 
And it was one of those things where I had to step off the cliff to realize it was only a one foot drop. <laughs> and it was, there was really no cliff at all. And once I did, it sort of all came together at once where I realized, wait a minute, I am an expert on staffing. I'm an mm -hmm. authority on this. My goodness, how, <laughs> how did I not accept and acknowledge that? And it's just because it, it, that's it's not the way I, I viewed it. I, was, I thought, well, that's not for me to share my opinion on until I started to and realized, wait, I, I, I've developed expertise over many years. Um, countless hours and why not share it? You know, if I'm in a position to help. I do yeah. have, have the, the knowledge that they can, that others can benefit from. And once I started to share that, the feedback was nothing but positive. Well, I won't say nothing but positive. Um, my views on Bitcoin that I've shared aren't, aren't uh, always received <laughs> um, in, in the best light, but that's okay. To, to your point, it's something that I believe in. It's something I'm willing to be challenged on and, I don't mind um, having those discussions. So uh, I, I would recommend if you have extreme views that are you know are controversial, you may want to keep those to yourself or find a, a channel to share those in that's not LinkedIn and maybe even under a pseudonym. <laughs> yeah, so proceed yeah. with caution there. But uh, the, the message that I want to share on this is just start doing it. Put you know, yep. your toe in the water. Make make you know, comment on things. To, you know, don't look to be controversial, but look to be engaging. Yeah. And um, once you start, I think you'll realize the water is warm, so that's to speak, right. and it's not that scary. It, it it's and and that's how we should leave it. Just dip a toe into it, keep trying it, but. The key is consistency. You've got to be consistent with it because the algorithm responds to how often you are commenting or producing content of the same kind of nature. And yeah, it'll spread the word for you. Consistency is key. So I'll, I'll make it, I'll, I'll say one last thing on this to make it really easy for, for everyone listening. If you want to uh, find ways to be engaging in the world of, of staffing or anything career related, Look at the content that Four Corner Resources and, and Zengig now puts out on our LinkedIn pages and share it and make a sure. comment or just reply to one of our articles that we put out there. And it's okay even if you want to challenge it or we post our podcast videos and, and um, or our podcasts, I guess. Comment. Tell, tell us, hey, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with you guys on X, Y, Z. And yeah we'll engage with you on it. And, and that's, that's all part of the deal. Once, once, because now we're putting out our opinions on these things and you know, we understand and, and accept that not everyone's going to agree and that's okay. Um, so that offer is out there now. If you want that's to right. comment on our stuff, we'll, uh, we'll engage with you and help, help boost you even at our own uh, expense. <laughs> oh, look at that. We're helping even when we're not helping there, Pete. <laughs> all right. Last yeah. question. All right. Today. What we got? This is serious, so so okay. bear, bear with me on this. This was sent in um, by someone um, last week. Oh, great. Here we go. And Poor I think relation. you've done this to yourself, Ricky. I got to be honest, but uh, here it is. This one's I'm pretty sure is directed at you. How yeah. do I cook the perfect ribeye steak? I can't believe I just read that out loud, but that's <laughs> the question. How to cook? Are you serious? How to cook the perfect ribeye steak? It's, it's written down right in front of me. I, I'm reading from the paper. Yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I gotta get ready for this one. Let Are you stretching? A bit. Let me stretch <laughs> this, a little bit because this is serious. You're not. You're very not joking. Few this people watch so these. It, this this is what we're like 40 <laughs> minutes in on, on, on YouTube. No one's seeing you stretch. So if you oh, well be listening, I'll tell you he's stretching. He's I'm stretching it. because this is serious business right here, Pete. I've been doing HR for 20 years and I love what I do. I got a passion for it, but I have an equal passion, if not more passion for barbecue, for a good, good steak. So I am so happy this question came up and I'm excited and I'm getting giddy. I need to control myself. A good steak, folks, it starts, it starts with the perfect marbleization, the perfect marble. What does that mean? When you go to when Dixie, when you go to Walmart, when you go to Publix, wherever you go to your local butcher shop to get your steak, you have two kinds of steak. You got the one that's 100% red, right? Really lean. There's no white in it, meaning there's no fat. And there's some that has really good fat in between. That's the one you want. 
You need fat. Look, if you're counting calories, get away from steaks. Okay. <laughs> if you're trying to cut out fat, steak is not the a ribeye steak is not the uh, the uh, the uh, place for you. Right now, here's where people mess up, Pete. They season the steak with all these different things when they're cold, and they throw it on the grill when the steak is cold. Big mistake. That is the best way to make your steak tough and hard and really hard to chew. When you throw it on the grill when it's cold. Here's what you do. God, I'm so happy this question came up. <laughs> so he goes, I, I'm going to do this as soon as we're done. I have nothing to contribute. I'm just <laughs> listening. Oh, no, dude. You play this back later on tonight. When you're grilling out, your family is going to love you for it. All right. So look. So when you get the steak, you season it with two things and two things only, Pete. Just two. Fresh ground pepper, fresh uh, ground salt. That's it. None of that other stuff, none of that other um, uh, 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 crazy kind of stuff that's out there, as simple as possible. The steak and the good marbling in there has enough flavor. But if you salt it, a little, you know, salt it quite a bit, not a little bit, quite a bit, and, uh, with, uh, 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 and pepper, it'll be perfect. The steak should be for a good, good steak, inch to an inch and a half thick. So all the marinades, yeah. throw them out. I, I, I don't deal with that. I don't deal with marinades. Okay. The only way I deal with marinades is if I do a skirt steak for tacos and stuff like that. But a ribeye, no, not 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 the not not the star of the show. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Oh, and I got to say this: if you buy a one with your steak, that should be illegal. Boy. That if I ever become look at you, you like I use a one. <laughs> if I become president, one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to outlaw a one steak sauce, and that should affect your credit score. <laughs> it really should. <laughs> do you like a one? Um, I do. Yeah, yeah, a lot. <laughs> on, on a ribeye. Oh, I, Pete. I don't, I don't know that I would make made ribeyes at home. At home. Okay. So. Gotcha. But yes, I like a one. Oh no, not not you know save that for your uh, for your lower end cuts, man. But okay. not 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 for the ribeye, right? Okay. So you season it, salt and pepper, right? And then you let it rest at room temperature for forty five minutes to an hour. Let it rest. Let it relax. Let it come down to heat up to room temperature. Once you hit forty five minutes to an hour, throw that bad boy on the grill. Now the grill has to be insanely hot, right? Bring it all the way up hot. And be careful because why? Because when that fat starts to melt and it hits the fire, it's gonna add fuel to the fire, and you're gonna have what I call the kiss of the devil, that flame come up, right? Ah. And that really puts that char on it. You put it on one side for a minute and a half to two, a minute and a half to two per side. That's it. Here's, that's it. I like my steak medium, medium. So medium. I'm starting to uh, see the error of my ways with a minute and a half. You see? The two. Now, yeah, now we're getting it. No, and we're not done, brother. We're not done. Check this out, right? A minute and a half to two minutes um, on either side. Don't worry about the uh, the uh, grill marks because we're going to cut this up later. So grill marks are not going to matter. I'm so far from worrying about grill marks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. So then once it's done and now you have to feel the state to know when it's done. Now, the people who are listening to this on the podcast, are not going to understand this unless I explain it, but I'm going to show you on video. If you take your hand and you put your your index finger to your thumb, right, and then push them together and then you you touch the meaty part of your thumb, that's going to be really soft, right? Yep. That is that is the consistency that steak needs to be for it to be medium to medium rare. Okay. Right? That's soft. Now, if you switch your hand and you go to your uh, to your middle finger and the thumb, it gets harder. That meaty part gets harder, right? <laughs> you let, dude, this is true. I, I'm man. with you. <laughs> Right? So then here's what happens. The more you move up, the harder the meaty part gets. The harder the it feels, the more well done it is. The softer it feels, the more rare it is. So, so am, I, am I poking it with my finger to feel it? How am I feeling it? No, either with your finger or the, or the tongs. Do okay. not stab it. Don't Do stab not cut into it. Not. I see all these videos, Pete, where people put these thermometers on it that is the worst thing you can do oh boy you, okay. because if you put a thermometer on it right you poke a hole in it all the juices come out so so right? when i cut it open to see what it looks like inside that's oh okay, okay. You, i'm gonna pass out I, i'm gonna pass out no, don't, don't do that <laughs> do that anymore <laughs> right now 
when you're done with the steak and you got to the doneness that you like, take the steak out. Don't cut it. Do not cut it. Put it on a plate, wrap it up in an aluminum foil and let it rest to 10 to 15 minutes. So if I want it medium, medium well. Uh, medium well. You, you going up there? <laughs> how, long do I, how long do I keep it on for? Uh, if, if you want... If you really want to ruin your steak and make it well done, <laughs> you oh. can leave it there for about six minutes per side. I highly, highly advise against that. I am not a well done person for a steak, but I know some people are. My wife is a well done person, uh, and she also likes A1, by the way. Okay, yeah. good. Well, she can do... come over. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> so, dude, so, so then, yeah, but I like a medium, right? I like how it's called Pittsburgh burnt. I don't know if you know what that is or everybody knows what that is. I learned this in the restaurant industry. Pittsburgh burnt means that it's charred on the outside, but pink medium on the inside. I, I, I would, I would call that ruined. No, that's not. <laughs> no. Oh no, man. Now, this is done properly. Okay. It's, so if I go for two and a half minutes, you're looking more it's if you, if you've done the proper prep, and you left the steak um, uh, for 45 minutes to an hour resting outside of the fridge, out in the uh, in a in an, uh, regular environment, two and a half minutes or more, you start to looking at the well, medium well, well done range. Wow. Okay. Medium, I, medium well, well. I've been overcooking steak forever. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so, so. But but the key is, Pete, it's you got to let it rest because if you cut into it as soon as you're done, the steak is still in that state where it's hot. All the juices are here and there. It doesn't relax, right? Okay. You got to let it relax, right? We want it to relax. We don't want to stab yeah. it. We want it to no. rest. There's a lot of, rest. there's a lot of, I see why you needed to stretch now. It's, <laughs> oh, I'm not done. I'm not done. Well, okay. Then, <laughs> yeah. Once it's done, take that steak out. You've got to figure out where the grain is and you have to cut it against the grain. Because if you cut it with the grain, what you're doing, you're cutting along with the muscle tendons, right? And it's not going to be as chewy, right? But if you cut it against the grain, when you got all these different tendons there, it gets nice and 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 uh, and uh, it it just cuts like butter, and it's such an amazing experience, you know. Not to be ruined with a one steak sauce. Then here's what you do, right? You cut it open, maybe season it a little bit more, serve it with some roasted potatoes, onions, or um, or uh, mushrooms that you cook aside with a little bit of brandy and cream. Oh, man, you're going to have an amazing night. That's amazing that. night. Yes, yes. That is that is my Saturday nights, my friend. Okay. Always well, in the back. You've given you've given a thorough a thorough answer. And we're going to have to do a video. We got to do You're going to have to come over. We're going to do a whole higher calling podcast, right? On how to cook the perfect steak. Yeah. I, and then I, people I get to help. watch us eat it. I need, I need help. Clearly. <laughs> this is good. I'm going to, I'm, I'm inclined to try now. That's I a great question. Well, I, I, I don't know if I want to <laughs> ask you this because we, we, there's a time limit. It's <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. I already stretched. So go ahead. Okay. Last question for real. This is for me. What's the difference between a cookout and a barbecue? Ooh. <laughs> so to me, to me, if I'm if 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 I'm barbecuing, it's just me in the backyard with a couple of beers. Okay. Kid running around, dog running around, got some music, neighbors maybe smell the smoke and they come over. A cookout, you send that invitations. Okay. Right? People come okay. over. I'm having a cookout. People are coming over. There's a lot of cleaning involved afterwards uh, with a little bit of a headache, but um, I've done both. And for a cookout, um, people bring different dishes that they say they're going to bring because it shouldn't be up to the person hosting. So people bring normally side dishes. And right. when I host a cookout, I do all the protein, provide some drinks, and people bring some side dishes. We have a blast. Okay. All right. Well, good. Now, now I know that. I didn't know. I didn't. I <laughs> now, no, no. Now, that's my definition. That is not sanctioned by the Barbecue Association of America, which is a completely made up association that I just did on the spot right now. But that is totally my opinion of what a cookout and a barbecue is. All right. So what we've learned is if you put that opinion on LinkedIn, you'll find out how accurate 
<laughs> Correct, you are right. So when we post this on LinkedIn, we should act, we should post that question. What is the difference between a cookout and a barbecue? We're and gonna have like, to. well, our marketing team, about? our marketing team will, and it's gonna be really weird, and and they're they're gonna. <laughs> They're going to have questions for me after this. Uh, so. it, you know what? They're going to have questions. And the number one question is, when are we doing this for the marketing team? Okay, that, well, that's what that's what they're going to ask. And I'd be happy to cook for them. They, they That will probably be their second question after what the hell <laughs> were, are you doing on the Higher Calling podcast? So oh, we're man, trying, it, we're trying to increase. Art. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a risky move. Uh, you know, the little Top Gun you know, reference to see is this going to help us increase listeners or did or are we just do we just slide back down the hill back to the bottom and we're having to come, start to climb up again I, I don't know because i think we're going to get more people because i'm I, I thought i was being controversial when i called out the people who like um a1 and i didn't know you like a1 so i'm sorry it's actually you have no idea you would have no idea of course but that i looked in our cabinet or our pantry to grab a one earlier the, in the week. And I noticed we have a few bottles of it and we don't just have oh, one. Wow. Bottle. The, the only time I have a one, believe it or not, is when I'm having steak at the, at, at the waffle house. Well, have you ever had a steak at the waffle house? No, it is. No. It is pretty good it, it, in comparison to what you think it is. It's pretty good, but I'm in waffle house for a reason late at night so yeah i may have a steak with a little bit of a of a of a a1 but if i go to longhorn steakhouse or the capitol grill or hortons i'm not asking for a1 Dude, i'll get kicked out it, that <laughs> this is starting to sound like something from the Chappelle show where you're a, a meat addict and you're going to the waffle house in the middle of the night to get a steak <laughs> that's <laughs> no hold on hold on nobody pete nobody ever says i'm going to the waffle house no one, no one says it out loud. Nobody ever says it. You just end up there. There's a big difference in going there for a reason and just ending up there. Huge, I, huge difference. I've ended up there late at night a few times. Oh, me too, it, sir. It's been a while. It's, it's not in recent memory. I think that's where we differ. <laughs> it wasn't reason for me either. Now that I know how to cook a steak, right? But back in the I, day, I let me tell you. I don't believe you and no one else <laughs> believes you either. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, well, yeah, that's how you cook the perfect ribeye steak. Folks, try that at home. Trust me, practice it. Look at some videos. It is an art form, and it's, you, you are going to have the best, most tender steak you've ever had in your life if you do it that way. All right. Well, that's, that's the note we will close on, and I yes, think sir. we've proven that we actually will address any question that comes our way. So, <laughs> any question. Great. Perfect. Awesome. There goes the show. So thank you, Ricky. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. Drive safe. We of course, welcome your feedback. We would love for you to rate the show. If you're willing to give us five stars in particular, that would be awesome. And email us higher calling at four corner resources.com and have a wonderful West rest of your day. Have a good one folks. Good night. Mm -hmm.